Welcome to Norse Code, the number one podcast for your Minnesota Vikings. I am your host with the most here, as per usual, and my name remains Dusty O'Connell. Joining me also, as per usual, Vikings blogger extraordinaire, writes for such illustrious sites as 1500ESPN.com and ColdOmaha.com, as well as many other sites of both good and ill repute. He's a generally useful human named Arif Hassan. How you doing, Arif? Pretty good. I'm pretty glad that the useful human title has like stayed true for so many shows. It's like it's like stuck. Well, no. I, so uh, that that is more due to the the listeners liking it than you being it, because I get well, uh, I get tuned up if I don't call you a useful human. <laughs> yeah, I thought it was because of pressure. For, I mean, again, I don't think it's because I'm a useful human, but I thought it was because I kept exerting pressure. But, I mean, if it's the listeners, that's even better. Well, at first you did, and then, uh, like, I, I forgot, and you didn't say anything about it, and then I heard about it on Twitter, and the next time I forgot about it, I heard about it on Twitter, and, like... That's uh, great. That's fantastic news. Like, uh, the great President George W. Bush once said, fool me twice, fool me... Fool Shame me. on, you can't, <laughs> fool, you can't fool me again. You don't get fooled again, is the point, <laughs> <laughs> is, is where we're at with that. So um, I'm glad you're uh, you're doing well. I am enthusiastic for both the winter solstice, which is sort of happening right now, that uh, generally heralds the pointless calendar change that is my birthday. I mean, we're all we're all one day older every day, but my my year turns over on Tuesday. So. <laughs> Dusty with a strong take against birthdays. <laughs> well, okay, so that's because December 20th is a terrible birthday. Like, it is. It's an awful birthday. I can't, my grandparents lucked out so hard. That's like, I was on, I was on like a, a, a 50% present system my entire like upbringing. And then when I finally became like old enough to appreciate having like actual parties for my birthday and not just like pin the tail on the donkey or, uh, or Duck Duck Grey Duck, which I apparently read on the internet is uh, something that they only call it in Minnesota. You and didn't know that? North Dakota. Well, I mean, I grew up in eastern North Dakota. That's functionally the world to me. Like, That's yeah. crazy because when I, when I was growing up in North Dakota, they actually just called it Duck Duck Goose. So you grew up in a different part of Grand Forks? Uh, no, but that was like, um, how old are you going to be, 28? No, I, I turned 28. I'm going to be 29 September next year. Okay, so you so yeah, you're like you're like seven and a half years younger than I am, and that's that's enough time for. So the rest of the country infiltrated Grand Forks in those seven and a half years. You know, I've always said that uh, North Dakota is about seven years behind the rest of America. That's true. And and actually, uh, South Park made the same joke about was it was it Iowa or Idaho? I'm I'm sure it was both. At any rate, it's still true. Um, but yeah, like after I became old enough to like have actual parties, no one ever came because they were all going home to their dumb families for Christmas. You weren't old enough to have actual parties until you left for college. I yes, wow. all right, yeah. Wow, yeah. I think that's your fault. Well, I I could I could like go to parties, but I couldn't like like throw parties. Like birthday parties and and it wouldn't have mattered because they still would have been lame because everybody would have been hanging out with their families as one does at Christmas time. Yeah, that's fair. So, I feel very sorry for you. Yeah. Well, the, this this actually represents the uh, uh, a year where I can turn over a new leaf. I have finally figured out that if you just invite enough people to a restaurant that has a good enough gimmick, then at least twenty people. Like once you transcend like college and have a lot of other like lonely friends who are like hooked on their jobs and terrible things like the Vikings, then uh, you can convince, you know, maybe 20 of them to RSVP for an event held at an awesome restaurant that is an awesome thing. So tomorrow will be judgment day for all those people who said they were going to come to my birthday party. This is very important to me. And I, I'm not trying to be one of those, like one of those people who's like, it's my birthday month. I think we both know one of those. 
Yeah, we do. We both know one of those very well. And he's like, it drives me crazy because like his birthday month is because there are so many people that want to have birthday parties with him. He can't do it all in one day. Yeah, that's, that's, I kind of hate him for that. It's an absolute he, embarrassment to riches. He travels for his birthday month. Up and down the eastern seaboard. I know. Right. I know. I'm, I'm privy to it. I'm not. On one of, of, of the years that he had a birthday month, he traveled not just along the eastern seaboard. I believe this only happened once, but still. But to the Midwest and to the West Coast. Oh, Jesus Christ. Right? Ugh. Wow. I'm, like, confident that part of this was, like, for work, and then he just worked it. But still. Still. I would... I would... I felt lucky to have, like, a month during this year. Actually, no, it ended up being six weeks during this year where I got to be, like, on one coast for a few days and then another. To have that be, like, associated with my birthday festivities is an absolute bridge too far. All right, I'll let him know when I see him. Yeah, okay. <laughs> um... Wow. Go Vikings, huh? Oh, yeah, we were talking about the Vikings. Ooh, wow, that's sad. Yeah. Well, it's, I mean, I, I was actually perfectly happy not talking about the Vikings, but since we're on, you know, depressing topics already, actually, let's, let's break from that for a moment because, um, you know, we always like to take a few minutes at the beginning of every episode and kind of laud the Norse Code community such as it is. We were actually talking during pre-show about how we get, like, the biggest boosts in listenership whenever the Vikings are actually winning. And so the, the five game win streak to start the season was just phenomenal for like listener numbers. You know, we had some really great guests. We got some, you know, we attracted some you know, new listeners. However, as that sort of evaporated and I think the final moisture molecules disappeared into the air on Sunday, uh -huh. we still maintained a year over year uptick of about, you know, the same percentage. So slowly, as Norse code exists longer and longer, it gets more popular. And we would like to believe that part of that has to do with the, you know, increase in quality of the show and our ability to, you know, push more bits to you guys in terms of, you know, bandwidth every month. And we would not be able to do any of that without support from our listeners. And the, and I specifically mean financial support. You know, it's, it, it is listener dollars that keep Norse code on the air. And I'm very proud of that fact. If anyone asks me about Norse Code, I will talk their ear off about how proud I am of that. And I'm very glad to welcome two new Patreon donors into the fold. Uh, Dylan Stancak. Stancak. Stancak? I think I, I think I got all three. Anyway, yeah, Dylan... I, I can't imagine another possible pronunciation, so I'm sure we've got our bases covered. I think that's all of them. Uh, Dylan contributes at the $5 a month level. Thank you so much, Dylan. We really appreciate that. And uh, Kristen, who helpfully does not include a last name, uh, contributes at the suggested $3.50 level. So we are uh, free from the influence of the Loch Ness Monster for at least one more month. And, really appreciate uh, that. Those, uh, those $8.50 a month do a lot, actually, to defray our bandwidth costs and, you know, the costs associated with maintaining a website and, you know, anything we can do to get ourselves above uh, 69 cents an hour in return for cranking out this show is, is good, but not the primary purpose. We would rather, you know, continue increasing the quality of the show so that we can continue to experience this, you know, year over year increase in listeners. And we definitely could not and would not do any of that without the support of listeners like Dylan and Kristen. So thank you so much to the two of you and to everyone else who has contributed or continues to contribute or will contribute in the future. If you feel like you might fall into that last group, then check out uh, paypal.me slash norsecode to make a one-time donation in any amount that you would like or uh, patreon.com slash norsecode to become a recurring monthly contributor. And like I said, we suggest uh, $3.50 a month. Skip one latte. And keep the Loch Ness Monster away. So for next week, well actually for later this week, I suppose, we've got planned a, uh, a Green Bay preview episode with the, uh, the great or less great Justice Mosqueda, hopefully. We actually, now that I've said it, he probably won't be able to come. 
<laughs> right, right. Or, or he'll he'll show up and we'll tape an entire episode and then something horrible will happen to one of our computers or the internet connection and then it just won't happen because it has literally happened to justice more than any other guest in the history of Norse code. But uh, but that is the the plan and I, and you know I, I feel pretty good like I, I think the intent is there given that he like publicly called you and me out like yesterday. Yeah, he's really excited, and uh, his excitement is, he probably doesn't listen to the podcast, is the worst part, <laughs> is, uh, makes me want to bring on a different guest just because it would be funnier, but he's provided such great hashtag content for us. Well, and there's, well, I, I, can, I know why he's excited, it's because, you know, Minnesota's crashing and burning, and Green Bay is on the rise in week 15. So... Um, it's a good time to get hot after you were terrible for so long. Well, See you in not the playoffs, Green Bay. <laughs> <laughs> what a Zing. time to get hot. Zing. But, well, but, hey, is there, is there ever not a good time to get hot? I mean, there, there are certainly better times than others, but it's better to be well, hot I, than I, not. I, There's a whole website I, dedicated to that point. <laughs> <laughs> I think the presumption of a time to get hot, like presupposes that not only were you not hot earlier, but you were cold. And so I guess you'd rather get hot at the end of a season uh, if you were going to be cold at the beginning of a season than, like, vice versa, which, hey, Vikings. Um, but, like, obviously it's always better to always be hot. Uh, were we talking about football? or Hot is better than not, is what I heard. Cool. It's also what I said. <laughs> <laughs> at, any, at any rate, uh, there will be a preview of the Green Bay game, and then we will, of course, take the weekend off for for Christmas. And there will be, uh, we've already, we've broken with Norse Code tradition and spent all of our best clips from the off season on a September clip show. So there will be a shorter clip show delivered as a Christmas gift to all of you who have been such dedicated listeners. We can, like, wedge in some of the off season clips, like, just to remind people of how awful we are. <laughs> well, and I, I uh, almost suggested to James, like, maybe including clips from clip shows, but that's like, that's a rabbit hole that I feel like we should avoid for at least a little while longer. <laughs> you know, in year five, when we begin recycling content. <laughs> in other news, media enjoys navel gazing. <laughs> All right. Well, in other other news... Um, the Vikings playoffs hopes were not like completely dashed, but functionally like all the way dashed. Yeah. Um, uh, so over the last couple of weeks, the Vikings, it depends on like which website, you know, is doing the odds calculating because they all have their own like, uh, internal model for like what predicts wins. But essentially they went from between 21 to 28%, you know, using like number five or 538 football outsiders to 14 to 18% using those three. And now, and none of them have updated as of like the recording of this podcast, but I imagine they're at 1% to 2%. Some of them might be at less than a percent. Um, so actually, actually, 538 might be updated by now. Um, but yeah, so they, they dropped from like 20%, 25% realistically to, uh, to like 1%. Well, and pinning it down in a, a, a less mathematical and a more like matchup style sense, even if the Vikings win out, they are not in control of their own destiny. They need uh, what? They need one team to win out and one team to lose out. So they need. So the Vikings need to win out. So that's step one. Step two is that Tampa Bay needs to lose out, which is tough. They're favored in one of the two games that they have. One is against New Orleans. The other one's against the Panthers. Uh, and uh, and it sucks because they're not like both away games. One's a home game, right? So the Vikings need to win out. Tampa Bay needs to lose out. Washington needs to lose one of the next two games. Could be both, could be one. In Detroit, this is weird, Detroit has to win one of the two games, and it doesn't matter if it's Green Bay or uh, Chicago, because if Detroit loses its next two games, then it's a three-way tie. So let's assume that uh, Detroit loses both games, so Green Bay wins one and then like loses against the Vikings, right? Because the Vikings went out in this scenario. Then it's a three-way tie. 
uh, between the Vikings, the Packers, and, uh, and the Lions. And even though the Vikings have a head-to-head against the Packers, the, com- the, the, the three-team tiebreaker is such that uh, the Packers win the division. No, the, it has to be the Lions. The Lions win the division, and the Packers are second, and then the Vikings are out because you're competing for the last wild-card spot, not the fifth-seed wild-card spot, which the Giants have basically already sewn up. So they need Detroit to win one of the next two. It doesn't matter against who. They just need to have a better record. Uh, than uh, than Green Bay to prevent the the three way tie, so those are the four things that need to happen. Uh, Vikings need to win out. Tampa Bay needs to lose out. Washington needs to lose uh, one of the next two. Detroit needs to win one of the next two. And that uh, ah, and what sucks the most is that by far the hardest part of that is going to be the Vikings winning out. Yeah, that's crazy, right? Like having the Vikings win out is. Maybe not like if if you did like a season long look at the Vikings is like odds you'd say hey the team the team that went five and zero and the team that went like one and seven or whatever the number is I'm not keeping track anymore uh, those teams are the same team you could just average them out and that's the usual outcome and that's really not what's happening obviously but if that was the case then there's a thirty percent chance or so that that happens that they win out uh, but it's not this is te- this is definitely the team that's like one and seven like there's no question right. Uh, and so that team probably has uh, like an 8% chance of doing it because the Bucks losing out, that's actually a pretty, that's a pretty low percentage chance because they're favored in one of the games. But that's like, that's like a 48, 54% chance, depending on what model you use. The Detroit Lions winning one of them, that's like an 88% chance. The Washington Redskins losing one of them, that's like a, like an 80% chance. So the, the, the toughest part is the Vikings. Well, and it's compounded by like, like we talked about this, you know, last week and the week before, and possibly even the week before that on the show. The Vikings struggled this year hard against divisional opponents, and maybe not the keystone, maybe not the total linchpin, but a big part of that was going to be beating the Colts. And this was supposed to be a comparatively easy win. We certainly treated it that way in our analysis last week. Yeah, I mean, the the Colts are bad. Like, that's it. They, and it's not like they look they pretty fine different. on Sunday. <laughs> the, Frank this is Gord. the team oh that, even though, because like, so they've got like two multiple score wins over the past couple of weeks, but they also like crapped out against the tech. I mean, it's not a good team. So, like, it's even more disappointing that the Vikings did this. Well, no, exactly. And, and they're, like, I'm not, I'm not arguing with you that the, the Colts are good. I'm just saying they looked good. Given how yeah, we look, like that's the problem. we laid supplicate before them on the field functionally, we were we we allowed Frank Gore a hundred yard game for reasons I will never understand. At least he looked like a real running back out there. Like who would have imagined? Like if you said in 2013, "Hey, Frank Gore and Adrian Peterson are going to play against each other uh, in 2016. Uh, one of them is going to have 150 yards." The other one's going to have, what, what did Peterson have, like 22? Uh, no, uh, like, I thought it was like 60. Didn't he have like... He had six runs and he averaged like 3.7 yards a carry, so... Oh, uh, okay, I thought, he, I thought he had uh, like 12 runs at 4 uh, yards 22, carry. yeah, he had 22. Okay, so... so. Well, that... Yeah, so one of them's going to have uh, uh, 101 yards uh, on the ground, and the other one's going to have uh, 22 yards on the ground. And Which one, one is of them it? is going to be playing against the best or second best defensive line in football. Right. And so, yeah. So Frank Gore against one of the best defensive lines in football. Uh, Adrian Peterson against one of the worst defensive lines in football. Who, who's the one that gets 101 yards? Who's the one that gets 22? Well, and and I, I tell you what, I, if, you, if you had asked me this like way back then, I would have said, I don't know, but I bet you Adrian Peterson fumbles in the red zone. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh man and i would have been right because that happened oh. but i mean at least give credit to adrian for uh stomping his dismal yards per carry well sort of think about minutes. this though think about this so he averaged 1.6 yards a game for the first two games right uh and he got 3.7 yards a game but if you get rid of that 13 yard run which it sounds insane because like what kind of outlier is a 13 yard run but you want to because of the fumble he averaged 1.8 yards a carry. Like that's not that much better. So he brought up his yards per carry average from 1.6 to 1.9 if you include the 13 yarder, 
But if you get rid of all the plays where he has fumbles, which is probably a pretty reasonable like thing to do to a running back, just, you, like, and you should penalize them more for fumbles because those are big. But still, if you just get rid of the runs where they have fumbles, you know he's uh, he's back to back. He he his average for the year is one point seven instead of one point nine. Like great, dude. Wow, and it's like, and we even even. And I, and I would prefer not to belabor it too much, but we didn't even talk about how, like, he completely blew up the teams and the media's spot by, you know, going on the radio and announcing that he was going to play this Sunday for for what? <laughs> right. for, so, uh, evidently, for I always listen to the radio show. Um, evidently. Yeah, because we were here. We, we got tired yeah. of listening to the radio show, and we started the podcast instead, and it totally wrecked our first 15 minutes. It did. That was, that was some, like, not-so-prime <laughs> podcasting. <laughs> he was so confused. But, but yeah, he, um, he evidently said on the show that the, the ball is never going to touch the ground again, or so, like, that he wasn't going to fumble again. Like, he addressed this specific point. And it's not like... It's not like you can just make someone never fumble. Almost true. Ask LSU. But... Um, you can get better at it. Like there, are, there's people who, like I think Cedric Benson got better at it. Ben Jarvis Green Ellis got better at it. A um, bunch of players who played for the Patriots got better at it. Legarrette like Blunt, for example. But like Deion Lewis, I, I think still hasn't fumbled. I don't know. Uh, Jerick McKinnon had a four percent fumble rate in college. I don't know how to describe how bad four percent is, except to say that the worst running backs and fumbles over the past couple of years, which includes Adrian Peterson. Fumble at like a 1.8% rate. So Jerick McKinnon had a 4.3% fumble rate in college. Has not fumbled in the NFL. So you can get better at it. But but this goes back to two things that we have like belabored at length on this show. Which is, well maybe not belabored at length. But we have definitely discussed Adrian, Propens- Adrian Peterson's propensity for just saying stuff. Whether, <laughs> yeah, whether right. or not it has any like... Adrian Peterson might be one of the worst promulgators of fake news in football because he is not concerned with any actual truth value that his statements might have just uh, as long as he feels they are true when he says them and other people believe them, they are thus true. (laughs) Yeah. It uh, it was so crazy because like we said, Oh, Adrian Peterson just says shit and not, not that week, but like a couple, like a couple weeks ago we said it, right? Yeah. That he just says shit. It was like two or three weeks ago when you were just like, this is just how he is. He just says things that he may not even necessarily believe. And you have, I mean, this has been a hard Viking season to predict, but you have been right in so many ways, like from every possible angle of looking at it. Like, <laughs> it's just like, so we say two weeks ago, and then, and then he does the most Adrian Peterson says shit thing of all time, which is to circumvent the team and traditional media channels, which you don't have to go through traditional media channels, but like, it's it's probably better because you have ways to craft. Anyway, you don't have uh, to wear a suit to a wedding, but you probably should, right. or else people in your family might talk. Right. So he he exactly. So he does the most Adrian Peterson says shit thing of all time. Second behind the time he admitted that he smoked marijuana while in a courthouse. But anyway. Um, by going on to the the online, because I don't think it's a real like terrestrial radio. I think it's just a. I shouldn't say real terrestrial radio. Uh, he goes on to like an online radio station that he is an investor in to announce the news in between uh, some like relatively okay hip hop. Like that's that's like it's the most like yeah I've got this I could just do this <laughs> and, like. And, like, I'm pretty confident that the team, and this is just conjecture for me, I don't actually know what the team told Adrian Peterson, but I would bet that the team not only told him, like, hey, we're going to activate you, try to keep this on the down low. Like, I bet they, like, slipped some sort of message, maybe didn't reinforce it enough, but slipped some sort of message, like, like, don't tell everybody, or at least implied it, right? Because that's, like, how these things work. Like, Mike Zimmer wouldn't tell us which left tackle was going to play, like, after it became clear that it was going to be Jake Long. Oh, we, like, well, we covered the whole like blow up about Zimmer getting caught in a dumb lie and trying to cover up for it. Like that's there's got to be at least one, two, maybe even three people who told Adrian Peterson, like, "Hey, just keep this, 
keep this to yourself. It's supposed to be a game time surprise. This is going to be your big reveal. And he was like, no, and he's I... like, big reveal? Yeah, that's a great idea. I got a big reveal for you. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but, but the other thing we talked about at length in seasons past was Peterson's like resistance to learning to carry the football in a way that would reduce his chance of fumbling. Like he's just, he's just so committed to his, you know, belief in his own strength and his belief in his own ability that he will not really change the way that he carries the football or the way that he runs through a line of defenders, even if it risks the ball getting punched out or a costly red zone fumble. It's, well, it's, it's, probably all part of the same like it's probably related to the says shit thing right which is a supreme amount of self-confidence right which is a generally a good thing especially for an nfl running back uh just partnered with like an assuredness that defies like a second kind of reasoning right just like like thinking again it's the same kind of like so he's got this enormous confidence, and that confidence is probably an enormous reason why he was such an amazing running back for so long. So I don't want to really want to take it away from him, but like the fact that he doesn't change his ball carrying style, which again a lot of running backs have done successfully without like hurting their yards per carry. Um, you know the the fact that he doesn't change his ball carrying style is probably related to the same kind of confidence that allows him to think that everything that he's saying like, makes all the sense in the world, right? Like, he told, like, so, like, a law enforcement officer, like, comes up to you and is like, this is very serious. Do you beat your kid? And he's like, yeah, all the time. <laughs> so, oh. Well, yeah, and then and, and then he goes back to Texas where he's, you know, surrounded by yes people, and they all decide to, you know, agree with him that it's a good idea for him to ride out to his own birthday party on a camel, which I will not be doing tomorrow, by the way. Uh, in the I, middle... I, I, this, the birthday month person might. I, okay. That's, that's fine. Uh, <laughs> birthday month guy has more yes men than I do. And I, sure. I, I do not know what the critical mass of yes men would be to convince me that that would be a good idea. But if I was in the middle of like uh, uh, an investigation, both at my job and by the courts, that might like oh, end yes, my career, uh, I would like to think that I am immune to the influence of yes men such that I would not do that. But here we are. And then there's the slavery comment that Peterson made about how NFL players are slaves. You just you, you encapsulate it so perfectly. He just he well. I, I would like to extend. I will I will take your initial argument that Adrian Peterson just says shit, and extend it to Adrian Peterson just says and does shit. Yeah, that's fair. <laughs> and so that's, anyway, that's 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 that. our uh, evaluation of Adrian Peterson's game. Ooh, wow, we already blew up our own show notes. That's fine. Yeah, I think uh, I think he had a seventeen um, percent success rate because. The one success, so success rate doesn't take into account fumbles. So technically, he had one successful run. It was the one where he fumbled. So you could say he had a zero percent success rate on his runs. Yeah, but you already talked about why you can't really do that. Well, I'm not doing it for everybody, so like that's probably not fair. But yeah. So let me ask you this: Would you ever like try to trade Adrian Peterson to the Broncos right now for Shane Ray? Yeah. What? Well, I mean, I don't know why Shane Ray, but like, it's good to have like a because he's a, Henry's a really good fourth defensive end. Yeah, and uh, the reason he fell to the Broncos was because he too smoked weed and admitted it. That's astounding, man. Well, that's oh, do you know uh, Jarek McKinnon had more yards after contact than Adrian Peterson? I cannot say Didn't I'm shocked by that. that. I did not know that, I, yeah. but it does not surprise me at all. That's interesting. Well, you know what? Just because you can, you know, uh, stem cell your way into freakish return from injury doesn't mean you can address the issues that have plagued your playtime for, what, two years, two and a half years now? Yeah, I mean, the past 11 games that he's played, including the playoffs. So, yes, two years. 
Okay, sure. <laughs> and I mean, and, and well, okay, so it's it's one thing to call it 11 games, but I mean, 11 games means something different in the context of one season than it does, you know, with playing with two different teams over the course of, you know, maybe three seasons. Right. No, I mean, that's true. And, and different, different personnel, not different teams, whatever. Anyway. I, I got what you were saying there. Um, yeah, I don't know. Uh, I don't, what do you think Adrian Peterson's trade value is? Not that they would be able to trade him or that they would. They might just cut him out right, especially because he's got $18 million on the cap uh, due next year. But, like, say a team was, like, open to this idea and this team was assured that they could renegotiate uh, the cap hit, right? So, uh, like, a team has enough cap money to take on the initial hit and then they'll renegotiate it for, like, a two-year deal. What do you think that that he'd be worth? Well, uh, that, that was exactly why I posited uh, trading him to the Broncos, because I, the Broncos picked up Justin Forsett. We'd be released by two teams this year, and I guess we kind of saw why in the Broncos game on Sunday. And I think you have to find a team that is equally desperate for any kind of like talented running back or skilled running back, and you have to get them right now. Because like it has to be somebody who has like the who's on the edge of maybe playoff hopes, like more so than Minnesota is this year, and then get them to commit to a deal that might take them to a, the playoffs and maybe a Super Bowl this year. Because at the end of this season, Peterson's trade value is almost completely gone, in my opinion. Well, you can't make any trades right now, which really sucks. It'd be kind of cool to see that. Um. Well, then, then, then nothing. <laughs> then, <laughs> then nothing. Then we have yeah, a like, boat so anchor around I don't think it's like, like, I know, because CJ Anderson's coming back at some point for the, for the Broncos, so. Well, I'll be fine there. Yeah. Yeah, uh, I guess. So, what, like, uh, so in the offseason, like, who, who would you, because Houston just paid big money to Lamar Miller, which was disappointing, I guess, uh, in this game. Miami probably still believes in Jay Ajayi, uh, even though that this last game was also poor. What about a uh, girly Peterson one for one trade? Why would either team do that though? That doesn't. I mean, that would be nice for us, but because uh, Ty Gurley sucks, then then why are we trading for him? Because like, he could not suck. Well, he didn't suck last year. Yeah, but that was last year. That's true, and he, and he did suck this year. <laughs> Um, uh, man, uh, Jacksonville, maybe, um, trade him for Julius Thomas. Oh yeah. Hey, I like that idea. That's not the worst. All right, done. We'll do it. <laughs> All right. Let's, let's get Spielman on the phone. <laughs> that's, that's our first. I have, and I actually have, uh, no idea about the, the contract implications. I imagine that, uh, that would probably be a net negative deal for the Vikings, but, uh, I mean, just, just because, you know, Jacksonville signed a Super Bowl winning tight end, probably to an exorbitant contract. I forget what the exact details are, but. All of Jacksonville's free agent contracts are exorbitant, either because they like spending the money or because it's harder to bring free agents to Jacksonville. But they always spend quite a bit of money. But luckily, they've always had quite a bit of money because they've gotten rid of all those people that they spent all that money on. Well, it's a, it's a new day in Jacksonville. No, uh. No Gus Bradley, no Julius Thomas, more Blake Bortles, more Adrian Peterson. Nothing can possibly go wrong. Yeah, that sounds like a winner. No, that's that's my idea. I don't know what. Uh, who else? You you must have at least one slightly more considered trade suggestion. No, that one was really good. Um, let me see. What about um? Yeah, Jasmine was really good. Probably not Indianapolis after what they just saw. Uh... Oh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. What if we traded for Frank Gore? That seems like it would be an upgrade. <laughs> what about a one for one for Melvin Gordon? The Vikings really liked him coming out of the draft. Wow, wow. Uh, Melvin geez. Gordon was crucial to my regular season success and then immediate uh, failure in the playoffs in fantasy football this year. And I am a a Melvin Gordon enthusiast. I thought he was just looking for a, a place to shine, and he got that for most of the regular season in San Diego. Um, right, and Melvin Gordon probably wants out of San Diego after seeing how they like treated all those other like 
players who played decently for them. But that's like, wow, man, Gordon's contract has to be significantly cheaper. Yeah, he's on a rookie contract. Man, there's, I just, that would, that would be phenomenal. That would be ideal. But I just don't see how they get past the giant disparity in contracts. Yeah, that's not going to happen. Well, you could trade him to San Diego for something else. They don't have an offensive line, so not that. Maybe a fifth round pick? Was he, is, that, is that what he's worth? Maybe a fourth? Fifth or sixth. All right, wow. We are such Adrian Peterson haters on this podcast. Sorry, guys. Yeah. Hey, well, Our formula is this. Things, Adrian right? Peterson sucks. Yeah. <laughs> Donate. Uh, <laughs> We're going to talk about the game, right? There's other things that happen in the game. Yeah, actually, I wrote the show notes in an entirely different way because I wanted to focus on just like the colossal failure at every level of our defense. We can talk about that in a second, but we were already talking about the offense. So we could talk about like the offensive line and the quarterbacks and the receivers. Well, all right. I think that makes sense. Then uh, let me... Oh, no, I didn't have any, any offensive questions. I mean, there are some offensive questions, but I don't have any offensive questions in the mailbag. Pretty usual. <laughs> Pretty so, usual, the offensive questions, I mean. Actually, no, I, I, I do. Uh, Josh Bjork uh, at Iowa underscore Josh writes in, why are all the replacement players playing terrible? I think, I think that specifically can be like zeroed in under the offensive line where we're, we're down to like, what, two backups backups? Yeah, this is the seventh iteration of the offensive line that the Vikings have started a game with. They've, of course, played with more iterations as in-game injuries have like changed things. Because uh, we've had Willie Beavers play, he hasn't started the game. Uh, you know, we've had uh, Searles play at guard for Alex Boone. Uh, you know, so the, the seventh iteration of a starting offensive line for the Vikings, which is special. Uh, and so you end up with um, T.J. Clemmings, who is the Backup to the backup. Oh, no, he's the... Yeah, he is the backup to the backup, uh, left tackle. Then you've got Jeremiah Searles, who's the backup to the backup to the backup at right tackle. Alex Boone's the starter. you got Nick Easton, who's the backup to the center. Uh, and then Joe Berger, who's the backup to the backup at guard, assuming that it was Mike Harris. Uh, so... And then, of course, you know, you had John Sullivan, who was cut um, for, like, veteran courtesy reasons. Uh, so, yeah... Those replacement players are playing terribly. I mean, because, you know, they're replacement players. I'm sure this question's like half facetious anyway. So, uh, yeah, they're playing terribly because they're terrible. Because that's why they're replacement players. Because they're on the third, if that, string, except for Joe Berger, who is now playing on the third string at a different position because we're so depleted at all positions that we have to do crazy things like that. Yeah, and what's even more nuts is that that might be like a more optimal solution than having having the backup backup there and then having the backup center play as opposed to just the backup there, Brandon Fusco, is more ideal. And then, okay, so this is what I like. And again, not going to happen. But, hey, now that we know that Berger can play guard again because he's been doing it friggin' his entire career and that Nick Easton is not awful at center, not great, made some big mistakes... Uh, but it's not awful at center. Why don't we move Alex Boone to left tackle? I, I should stop suggesting it. I'm just saying put put Berger there, put Brandon Fusco at right guard. It's throwing it out there, man. That seems like one of those, uh, like when you're like mid to late game in chess and like all of your initial moves have broken down and you're like playing somebody that's better than you and you're just like trying to wing it and you, you try to like like build one last offensive push with like one bishop and two knights and like five pawns. Right, like like you, you start crafting your strategy to get a pawn promoted and it's so obvious that that's what you're doing, but you're not gonna like conceal it in any way. Like like everybody on the everybody watching the game knows that's what you're doing, but you think you might just have the strength to defend that little pawn. Yeah, right. Yeah. So if I can just dance my king around and just guard this pawn and ah crap. Oh, oh, my night! Oh, my night went down. Oh God, it's over. Nah, <laughs> that's essentially what the Vikings are at. Yeah, man. Uh, so, well, so uh, the specific play of the offensive lineman is kind of interesting to evaluate because uh, it wasn't like all bad, as it were. Like, uh, so 
I think all of the offensive linemen made mistakes in this game, made big mistakes in this game. But on the whole, some of their play was actually uh, you know better than others. So, for example, Jeremiah Searles had a relatively averageish game, which is the first time we've seen that in some time. He was playing really well when he was a backup. And then when he started starting, he was playing very poorly. Uh, this is the first time since he started starting uh, that I thought that he played fairly reasonably. Um other than that, uh, I think Alex Boone, and he had a huge mistake. So it's not as if, uh, you know, he was he was clean or anything like that. Uh, but Alex Boone, you know, he's been playing pretty well for the past, like, eight or so weeks. Uh, and, you know, I thought he had an all right game, especially as a run blocker. Uh, Berger had probably the best game out of all of the, you know, offensive linemen. Uh, again, not as good a game as he's used to having, especially at center. Um, but still, it was like a pretty good game. Uh, and so I would say he was playing above average. Searles and Boone were playing at about an average level. Of course, there were five sacks in the game. Uh, and uh, and Bradford was pressured a little bit more often in this game than he was uh, in in a lot of, uh, in, in like the past five games, ever since Pat Shermer took over. Uh, and he didn't play particularly well under pressure either. Um, but, you know, I, I think that we can say that, hey, there were some salvageable-ish offensive line performances here. I think Clemmings played awfully. You know, that's predictable, uh, both uh, as a pass protector, as we definitely saw, and as a run blocker. I think Nick Easton, again, is displaying uh, poor ability as a run blocker, but he's pretty good as a pass protector, and I think I saw that again in this game. So... That's kind of how the offensive line played. Uh, I think that Strolls was much better as a pass protector than as a run blocker. And again, he wasn't, you know, perfect. He he made you know two or three big mistakes that I can remember as a pass protector. But I don't think he made any of those small mistakes that kind of doom offensive line. Like Matt Khalil's biggest problem is that he made dozens of small mistakes over the course of a game. Uh, maybe one or two big mistakes. But you can you can get away with one or two big mistakes if you're not making any other mistakes. And I think Searles kind of did that. He made some pretty big mistakes in pass protection, but he was all right as a pass protector. He was worse uh, as sort of a run blocker. And those those two tackles being poor run blockers led to a lot of, you know, stops behind the line of scrimmage as a result of defensive ends or linebackers kind of looping around the line. Uh, you know, Berger and Boone did, a, did an all right job keeping, you know, some of those defensive tackles free. Uh, Easton, again, you know, made a couple of mistakes. And that's kind of why Adrian Peterson and, and Jarek McKinnon were hit so often uh, early uh, and even behind the line of scrimmage. I think Peterson on those other runs, uh, was hit behind the line of scrimmage uh, on on four out of his five other runs, and then of course on that sixth run, uh, you know he wasn't hit uh, behind the line of scrimmage, but you know gave it the fumble. Jarek McKinnon uh, did a pretty good job, kind of avoiding that contact, but was still hit fairly often. Uh, so that's kind of how that offensive line played out, and I'll say it was the worst performance in the past couple of weeks. There was more stress put on them uh, in this game, and I'm actually okay with that because you need to gun for big plays when you're down by like three or four scores so you have to put right you have to like that's that's one of the biggest problems that i don't think people talk about a lot when it comes to having a bad offensive line is that it disables your play calling and in many ways some of those plays are are the kind of plays that you need to come back from a deficit uh and so no i definitely watched that like just uh in the carolina game tonight like yeah, Washington yeah, exactly. got down and it turned them, I mean, John Gruden said it himself, it turned them into a one-dimensional team where everybody knows what you're going to do because it's the only thing you can do to get you out of your jam. Yeah, uh, and 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 the Vikings just don't have the talent up front to... To like deal with the reality of uh, we know what you're going to do. Like that's well, but this has just, been the story of the whole season is that they don't really have the tools on the offensive line to let the offense get them out of any jam, whether it's you know through a run or through like a screen pass or through play action. Like there just isn't there aren't the the tools that stall defenses enough to let us do anything other than what we're obviously going to try to do. Yeah. So like. So that, that that happened in this game where they were under more stress in this game than they were in the past couple of games. Even though they, I mean they were losing those other games, but like they weren't losing rather as as much so as to require predictable play calling as early as the second quarter uh, is is kind of one of the differences. And so 
that's why the offensive line seemed to have performed poorer because they they were performing at maybe a similar and even maybe even a better way, but were put into tougher situations by just sort of the realities of the game. Um, I mean, McKinnon had a better game than Peterson, but it's not anything to write home about. I thought that he had a couple of good, uh, and and this is taking out sort of all those consecutive garbage time, whatever. Uh, I mean, that was great, but uh, who cares? Uh, but even before that, I thought he, he was doing a really great job as a receiver. He was doing a fine job as a runner. This is the first time I think, well, obviously it's the first time since week two, but the first time that, you know, we saw like an equitable amount of carries between the two in somewhat similar situations. Uh, and I think it, it's pretty clear at this point that McKinnon is a better running back. Uh, yeah, and he's better in pass protection too, which is kind of a thing that I didn't necessarily expect. Like it's not a high bar to clear, but he cleared it. And so he's better as a receiver, which is interesting because he's got such tiny hands. He's not used to being a receiver because he was a quarterback in college. Uh, and um, and he really, like the people, or not the people, people in general assume that they see a small shifty running back, like your Tree Archers, like your Jarek McKinnons or whatever, and they assume that he's going to be a good receiver because he's got a lot of physical tools that a lot of these slot backs have, like Darren Sproles, right? But McKinnon had a lot to overcome because he had never really run routes before. He had never really caught a pass before, you know, uh, and he has, and he's already a better receiver uh, than uh, some of the other backs on the roster. Now, I don't know if, like, you could say he's a better receiving option than Matt Asiata, because Asiata seems to do more with his catches. He definitely catches a higher percentage than the McKinnon does, but, like, the only reason he seems to get yards is because no one treats him as a receiving threat. I don't know if that, that might be better. Who knows? But I, don't, I, think I, I think that's better for like two games at most. I think I think sustainably it's, it's close to even, but McKinnon seems to do a better job of throwing incipient tackles because they're actually there than uh, than Asiata does. I don't know. Yeah, uh, you you can't use Asiata as a consistent receiving threat. That's the yeah. I think that's a fair point. So yeah, I think it's somewhat clear at this point that McKinnon is a better running back than Adrian Peterson. And again, that sounds like a weird thing to say. If you've been listening to this podcast for, you know, the season or for a couple of seasons, you kind of know that my take on Adrian Peterson is what it is and that it it assumes that he's no longer the Hall of Fame capable running back that he once was. And I kind of want to make it clear, I haven't always bagged on Adrian Peterson. He was an incredible running back for a very long time. Uh, Even if you take into account you know, hey, he fumbled more than his contemporaries. Hey, he was not as good a pass blocker as his contemporaries. Hey, you know, he's not a good receiver as his contemporaries. Because he was just such a stellar runner that he was just, you know, ahead of the pack. Like, I, I thought he was better than LaShawn McCoy. I think that the Jamal Charles thing gets kind of complicated because there's really good arguments for Charles. But I think that you could count on Peterson to do friggin' amazing shit much more than you could Jamal Charles. Uh, and so I don't want to, like, say I've always hated Adrian Peterson or whatever, but I, I think that in the context of the current Vikings, I think that McKinnon's a better back. And I, I'm a McKinnon-like truther. I think that there's not very much good statistical or productive evidence to indicate that McKinnon's a very good running back. I'm just kind of going with, you know, what I think is necessarily true. Uh, and um, I'm kind of getting, like, you know, some egg on my face for it just because his year hasn't been so good. But I still think that this game provides one demonstration of why, you know, McKinnon in similar situations, because, you know, they got... They got drives. You know, Peterson got one drive, McKinnon got another drive, and stuff like that. They got drives where they were put into similar situations, and I think McKinnon outperformed them. Um, so we've got, like, that kind of going forward to look forward to. I think that this is still a really good situation for a running back by committee next year, uh, assuming that they find, like, either that C.J. Ham is, like, good enough to, to make the regular uh, season roster or that Matt Asiata uh, kind of improves in some of the ways that he was, you know, good in 2015 for, so long as they improve the offensive line. Um, so that's that's one takeaway from the game. In this game, I was I thought the passing game was really unspectacular from Sam Bradford, and I, it, it's different because I, I watched uh, the broadcast uh, earlier today because I was at the game. So I watched the broadcast earlier today. And what's really frustrating is that, and this just t- tends to happen with the broadcast view, is that we didn't get to see sort of which receiver Sam Bradford passed up. Uh, and earlier in the season, um, not. In the Green Bay game, I think in the Green Bay game, he played pretty spectacularly, but he didn't have to do this, which is move to his second and third read. Earlier in the season, you know, uh, in 
in his second game, the third game of the season, in his fourth, uh, in his fourth game, the fifth game of the season, you know, he was doing a pretty good job moving off of his first read, getting to a second read, or moving off of his second read, getting to the third read, and finding sort of the most appropriate way to to make uh, the other team pay for the way that they prioritize their defense or what coverage they had and stuff like that. And in the past couple of games, but especially this game, it seemed pretty clear to me that Sam Bradford kept on making the wrong decision. Not And he had a 75% completion rate or something like that. It's not as if he was making a decision that would prevent the Vikings from advancing the ball, but he kept on making decisions that prevented the Vikings from doing anything with it. Like So, for example, on third down, he would go to his first read, and his first read, not always, but very often, would be short of the sticks. And there were receivers that were open uh, in other parts of the field that were not short of the sticks, uh, that he could have gone to, that either he should have made them the first read based off of the coverage that he was seeing and the way the receivers were aligned and what routes they would run, or he should have moved on from that first read uh, to you know his second or third read in order to get those decisions. And I said this on Twitter, and after watching, you know, the All-22 is already out, which is pretty ph- phenomenal. After watching a lot of the All-22 uh, and the broadcast angle, I think it's pretty clear that it is the case that Sam Bradford was not moving off of his first read, and therefore was making more difficult throws that, if completed, were less rewarding than some of the easier throws that he passed up. There was one particular throw. It was, uh, I, I think, late in the first quarter uh, to Kyle Rudolph on a third and seven. And Rudolph was like three yards out from the line of scrimmage. And Bradford, you know, completed a difficult pass into double coverage, but you'll never guess what happened to Kyle Rudolph afterward. What happened to Kyle Rudolph afterward? He was instantly tackled. <laughs> that's crazy. I know. Who would have thought that that's what would happen? Wow. Four yards from the down marker? I know. Uh, pity. How rude. <laughs> um, I'm actually about to pull up that play because uh, I, I think I remember what you're talking about, but I want to make sure. So it was like late in the first quarter? Yep. Right. Uh, late first, early second. I was uh, I was going over the condensed view in uh, in pre-show, and and that that toss in particular stuck out to me as just like the kind of Sam Bradford that I guess the Rams have seen and the Eagles have seen that we would have preferred not to see, and we have done a pretty good job of you know, keeping the Vikings from seeing. And to his credit, Kyle Rudolph has been good in, in spots like that or better than he has been in the past with different quarterbacks. But this was just like, like not even really trying for the first down. And I, I haven't watched the All-22 on this particular play, but it wouldn't surprise me if Stephon Diggs was, you know, down there six yards, two yards ahead of, or, you know, five feet ahead of his defender, Waving his hands. All right, so that's uh, looks like it was actually on the first drive. This is great. Uh, the first drive happened fairly late, so <laughs> you could be right that it was late in the first quarter and it still happened on the first drive. Uh, All right, so I've, this is I've this is why play. it's so frustrating to try and watch the Vikings with like red zone channel or whatever, because you can, you can watch the entire red zone channel and see maybe one play from a Vikings game. And it's not the Vikings with the ball. So, uh, it's Bradford on a crosser, but he's got a, uh, uh, a defender bearing down on him. So by the time he receives the ball, he gets tackled. Like you said, uh, you've got two players in the slot as well. Uh, that run a switch concept against man coverage. One of them runs straight into a defender as a result. But you've got one player streaking down the field on a nine that's open. He's got leverage on the cornerback. Uh, I want to say that that one is uh, is Stephon Diggs. No, it's Adam Thielen. Uh, and then Stephon Diggs was open on an out, and he even pointed to himself after the after the tackle. Yeah, oh yeah, he was way open on an out. Called it. Uh, yeah, so both Stephon Diggs and, and Adam Thielen were open uh, to the same side of the field that Bradford threw, and he chose not to throw it. And those were actually somewhat easier throws than the uh, than the Rudolph one. Uh, both of them, are, or all three of those throws are like out throws, but he has kind of a smaller window to throw it to Rudolph and still get yards after the catch. Whereas if he just throws ahead of Adam Thielen, uh, that's Adam Thielen has the ability to run and get Thielen it. Thielen catches it running and then goes for X. 
Right. So yeah, and, and that happened pretty consistently throughout the game. So uh, uh, if if you remember uh, the Adam Thielen amazing catch not catch out of bounds on the sideline. Ah. Um, yeah. Uh, which I mean, it was a phenomenal athletic feat from Adam Thielen, right? So on third and thirteen, that one was at least past the sticks. But uh, the the only possible the only possible scenario is that you get a first down for thirteen yards. That's a fine outcome, but. Uh, I was watching it live and I noticed that Rudolph was open, uh, not wide, wide open, but but pretty open. He had one receiver that was trailing behind, or one defensive back that was trailing behind him. The single high safety was way too high to do anything. He could have thrown him open, gotten 16 to possibly 40 yards. If he breaks that first tackle, he's only got to deal with that one safety. Uh, or he had um, he had the other two. Everybody ran routes past the sticks except the running back. Everybody was in single man coverage because it was a blitz. Uh, and uh, and all of them had leverage. There's one receiver, uh, I'm pretty sure it's Stephon Diggs, that's running an in-cutting route that wouldn't have gotten yards after the catch. It's more likely to be completed because Thielen's on the sideline. And then, of course, you've got uh, Patterson or Adam Thielen, again, I'm not looking too deeply, uh, running deep downfield with leverage on the quarterback. So, And this was just a consistent problem with Bradford throughout the game. I think I saw Diggs get open, because uh, he's a fun player to watch, actually, live. Uh, I think I saw Diggs get open on uh, the majority of his routes in a way that like reminded me of that Greg Jennings photo essay I posted a long time ago. Uh, Greg Jennings is always open. Uh, I saw Diggs get open on a number of routes and simply not get targeted because that's not where he was in the progression. I saw Adam Thielen do pretty well until he got injured uh, with a concussion. Uh, and, I, and Bradford kept on throwing to, um, uh, to, to receivers that were just more covered. Uh, and it's it's just like frustrating, or, or to receivers that were just like too uh, far below the sticks. And it's just like, like he just physically was closer to whether him. or not they were open. Yeah, wildly frustrating. And I, I mean, I, I guess I'll have to go back and like watch the uh, the all twenty two a little more, just so I can be even more frustrated by this. But that like just watching from the broadcast angle, that was the the impression that I got was that he was, you know, picking the guy. That was five yards away. So, yeah, so that's that's the issue uh, with Bradford in this game and has been for the past couple of games. So this is when we, so when we had uh, Ben Natan on the show to tell us a bit stuff about Sam Bradford. He said something fairly incendiary about Bradford is that Bradford is a coward, which I tried to, you know, ameliorate a little bit. Be like, well, like, he's tough, like he's willing to take hits and uh, and he's not afraid to like play the game. From the perspective of like the physical toll that like football takes, it. well, in the first you know, ben, eight or nine games he played, he didn't play like a coward, right? And you know, so we saw some of those that. flashy plays. But this is the kind of stuff that he was talking about that Bradford would go to his first read or he'd go to safe throws instead of making throws that actually accomplish goals that the offense needs to have accomplished, uh, like you know a first down or a touchdown. Ugh. And the thing is, like on a lot of these, a lot of these, when his first read was open, obviously it was working. So I think Bradford had a below average game. I'm not saying he had an awful game. You know, obviously, like if you complete 75 percent of your passes, your downside is pretty limited unless you know all of them are for two yards, and they weren't. Like and actually, you know, made this some more week he took sole possession of uh, leading completion percentage after the New Orleans game. So. So his his numbers his stat line looks fine, but dot dot dot. Right, uh, Ian. Honestly, like I think that I, I think that, and we're we're not huge fans of completion rate here on Norse Code. Um, I think that generally uh, I tend to underrate it as a statistic because like it's important to generate first downs and completion rate is a somewhat decent proxy for that. For Drew Brees, it definitely is. Like his completions tend to be first downs. This is not really the case uh, with recent Sam Bradford. Earlier Sam Bradford, uh, earlier in the season, that was the case, uh, and it's something that like maybe you could make the argument for passer rating over like adjusted net yards per attempt or something. Um, but yeah, right now it's it's frustratingly not true. So that's what happened sort of in the offensive side of the ball. We had very poor run blocking. We had unspectacular running from the running backs. Very good receiving. I think Kyle Rudolph played, you know, a very good game, for example. I think Stephon Diggs, despite only having, like, two catches on, like, three targets or something, had a very good game getting open. Um, Adam Thielen, before he was concussed, had a phenomenal game. Um, Probably better than anyone else on the offense. Uh, So, but when you have, you know, someone who's running the offense 
uh, as a quarterback who's not aggressive enough or uh, you're trying to run the ball. And they didn't run it too often, and I don't really blame them for it. Like, Adrian Peterson only got six carries. That's not his fault, even though there was a fumble in there. It's because the Vikings were too far behind to be able to run the ball. Um, you know, but when you when you can't early on run the ball, uh, then you're in situations where you can't keep the offense on schedule and convert on third down. So that's what happened offensively. I think the skill players are fine. I think everyone else is like, or not the skill players, just the receivers are fine. And then everyone else is like up for the firing squad, as it were. Well, then um, let's talk. Well, so we didn't really expect that much out of the offensive squad. Let's talk more about the squad that we expected to step up I, uh, we sat here and talked about the Colts as though they were going to be just like a, like a walk, like, uh, like our unstoppable line would just bottle them up. You know whose name we never said in the entirety of the podcast? Frank Gore. Cordero Patters? Oh, Frank Gore. No. I guess, uh, I guess the Vikings forgot about him too. Yeah, well, th- this is also like very frustrating for a completely different reason. Uh, <laughs> no, no, you're right. It it is super frustrating because it, like this this represents like a like a like a breakdown of the qualities that the Vikings have maintained like all throughout the season. Well, if you if you do like a PFF style grade of the defensive line. But you're only given three numbers, plus one, zero, and minus one. If those are the only numbers you get, and you do that kind of grading, the defensive line comes out really, really ahead. They come out, like, very nicely. But if you impact it for what the play resulted in, they come out way behind, because they made a bunch of really good plays, and then they, like, they gave up really big plays. Like that's that's the biggest issue, and that happened a lot in the passing game as well as in the running game. But consider this: Linval Joseph had seven run stops. Like that's the number of times that uh, a defender makes a tackle that constitutes a failure for the offense. Uh, that's incredible. There weren't that many runs in the game uh, early on, and that's when most of his run stops occurred. Uh, so to have seven run stops is just astounding. Well, okay, then uh, uh, then let me dig into the mailbag for a second. Uh, OPM at Gone Fishing 58 writes, does Linval Joseph's attempted center jump go down as the dumbest play of the year? Well, the Colts special teams play happened last year, so that has to be that has to be up for the running, right? Because the Colts special teams play where they like snapped it to Griff Whalen or whatever is the dumbest play of all time. And the dumbest special teams play of all time, <laughs> not necessarily, right? Winning two awards. Right. Um... But Linval Joseph's play, I can't think of a dumber play. I'm sure it's happened. I'm sure a coach has designed. Like, I think if a coach designs a play to be dumb, that's inherently dumber. But I can't think of any off the top of my head. Hopefully our listeners will come in with, with some suggestions for dumber plays and with a preference for plays that were designed to be dumb from the offset. Um, but, yeah. Well, so, and that's why I think this one is an outlier and why I wanted to highlight it in line during our recap. Yeah, and it's really important to, like, talk about like this play because so first Linval said it so Chris Thomason interviewed him after the game uh, and he's like w- I jumped but I didn't try to jump over him is what he said uh, he said that uh, and I haven't like watched a high def replay uh, is that like when the Hulk says Christ I tried did. to crush the rock but I didn't try to like crush it into sand <laughs> right um, okay now I'm, now I'm watching a high def replay that Justice posted uh, Linval might be might be right. I don't know. That's not it's not a very good replay for that. Um, oh, here's a better replay that he also posted. Man, he really likes this play. Well, that's not no. Good. Linval's wrong. Linval's wrong. He lied. Linval said he wasn't trying to jump over the center. He was just trying to jump up, and because they went low, which you should probably expect, Linval, uh, you know, he f- basically fell over them. And there's p- part of that replay kind of corroborates with that because he didn't get his hands up, right? Like, if you're jumping over a lineman, you're getting your hands up to block it. And he just, like, fell over him. <laughs> no chance of a block. Um, but, uh, 
But wa watching this, it really looks like he's trying to... Yeah, it definitely looks like he's trying to, like... It's like the police report over. where the uh, the vehicle on human collision driver was like, a pedestrian hit me and went under my car. Exactly. It's He's exactly that. He's, like, putting his hands out so he can vault over. And honestly, this is a really impressive athletic feat. It's also super dumb. Yeah, well, that's... Exactly. Linval Joseph is not a man. He is a beast. And he's so trying can, to do, like, wow, these things this that is are... Incredible. <laughs> Outside of the context that it's super dumb and it cost the Vikings four points, that's incredible. <laughs> that's nuts. But he clearly did it on purpose, so... Stop lying, Linval. Uh, yeah, it's just one of the, like if you and I know you can't because it caught it's the one of the biggest impact plays of the early game because uh, it costs four points. Like no play really costs four points by itself, right? But this one did because the expected point total before the play, before the penalty, was three points because they were kicking a short field goal. The expected point total after the play is something like six point eight or something like that. Because they were close enough to the end zone where they probably would have scored. So basically, it, it by itself cost four points. Um, so you can't take it out. But if you want to like think about his game holistically, he's one of the best games that a nose tackle's put together this season, including his own games. He, just, he, he had a phenomenal game. Like He was incredible. But... but when it mattered, he gave up points. Just like everybody on the Vikings did. Yeah, okay, so here's another interesting thing. This is the best pass rushing game that Brian Robinson has had all year, maybe for the past three years. He had an incredible game as a pass rusher. It was also his worst game as a run defender. Like, come on, man. <laughs> Figure it out. Regrettably, sometimes trying isn't good enough. You have to be good at everything for three, three entire hours. Yeah, it's crazy. Uh, Shamar Stefan had a pretty good game, so he's probably the only one that I don't think made... No, actually, I sh that's lying. Now that I think about it, he got pushed off the ball a couple of times. Tom Johnson, there we go. There's a guy who had a good game. Oh, Everson by Griffin the way, uh, Tom game. Johnson, out for next week. Yeah, torn hamstring. Uh, out for the year, which, two weeks. But <laughs> uh, Two and the playoffs, maybe. Two weeks and the playoffs. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay, okay. <laughs> so, Tom Johnson, good game. Now he's dead. Everson Griffin, <laughs> poor game. Daniel Hunter, kind of like Brian Robinson, did a great job generating pass rushing pressure, had some issues uh, as a run defender, which is the exact op uh, opposite of his career at LSU, and also kind of doesn't fit his MO for the Vikings this year because he's been really a spectacular at both. Um, but yeah, it's... Go Tom Johnson. Oh, you're dead. Yeah, of course, because because why wouldn't you? This is like like Game of Thrones, Viking style, right? So here's okay. So we can move on from the defensive line to talk about the linebackers. Here's something that I noticed during the game that when I looked after the game to see what the discussion was, wasn't really getting played out, which is that I think Eric Hendricks had a really, really up-and-down game. Like, I, I think that he wasn't evaluated fairly. I think a lot was of people... It, was it up-and-down in the sense that he played very well, but then gave up a couple of huge plays that led to points? Exactly. Oh! How did I guess? So most people were like, Eric Hendricks had a bad game. And I don't really want to disagree with them. Because his bad stuff was worse than his good stuff in terms of the impact it had on the game. But his good stuff was really good in terms of, like evaluating like how difficult it was to accomplish you know those goals uh so i mean he was he was a beast in in run stopping uh he was not as much when it came to open field tackling for yards after catch but he was he was really good at generating tackles for loss uh or or for you know generating tackles at the line of scrimmage or something like that uh he was a magnet to the ball in a good way in the running game uh, he knifed around, you know, blocked. It's a, it's the exact sort of thing that made me advocate for him coming out of the draft despite his size. Because, you know, a lot of people, and they're right, a lot of people were concerned about his size and were also concerned about stuff on the film about him taking on blockers poorly. And, and they had a really good point, but I thought that 
his instincts not only gave him an extra step ahead of those blockers, but also that he was gener- like he was creating better technique for himself over the course of the year, that he was teachable in terms of technique to be able to take on those blockers, and he displayed pretty uncommon strength for a person of his size. And that's kind of what we saw in this game, that he was able to do that. He was also, shockingly, kind of dog shit in coverage. Um, he's been He's been more up and down this year and last year in coverage that I think... Uh, sort of the national media kind of paid attention to because they knew that his coverage skills were a thing coming out of the draft. He had some really nice highlight plays in coverage last year that earned him, you know, defensive player of the week honors and they earned him like some notoriety and rookie recognition honors and stuff like that. But he's kind of up and down in coverage. And in this game, he was mostly down. Um, and so his coverage was really poor. His run defense was really good. He did make some big mistakes in run defense as well because who didn't? Um, but it should be noted that there were really positive things from him as well, not just negative things. Uh, Greenway, everyone kind of remembers the big play to, what's his name, Eric Swopes? Swope? Swope. Swoop? Swope. The tight end who scored his first ever touchdown. That yes. guy. Uh, that's the one Greenway gave up. Let, let's call him Eric. And actually, Eric. Uh, uh, Josh Bjork at Iowa underscore Josh. Writes in with another question that I, we will answer in line. Why would one design a play where Greenway covers a receiver? It's technically a tight end. Um, There's your answer, yeah, Josh. I, I don't. I don't know. Uh, Greenway is the weak side linebacker. Very often, you have your weak side linebackers covering tight ends. Um, in the way that the Vikings have set up their weak side linebackers, which is the weak side linebacker is actually at the strength of the formation, unlike most designations of. I mean, it, it makes sense, obviously, that the weak side linebacker would be at the weak side of the formation, but they're not. They're at the strength because the Vikings play a 4-3 over. Um, so very often those players will end up covering tight ends, uh, which is what the Colts were hoping for. So this is something that Matthew Collar pointed out that I kind of want to dig into a little bit further, but uh, the Colts kept into three tight end sets to keep Chad Greenway on the field, and then they targeted him and the other linebackers their tight ends uh, because they knew that Captain Munderland in coverage it was much better oh, against so a slot receiver. Rude. Yeah, yeah. It's just come on. Uh, we all agreed we were a nickel league. What is this? But, um, they, this has happened a couple of times uh, this past year, where the where the Vikings have been up against teams that have been in three tight end or, or or whatever sets or you know two two running back two tight end sets in order to put Chad Greenway on the field in order to exploit him, and it says a lot about Greenway and Munnerlin, that teams are identifying this as a weakness. A positive thing, very positive things about Munnerlin, pretty negative things about Greenway. And I believe in every every game, and I have to double-check this, so don't like quote me on this until... Uh, actually, you know, I'll put it in the show notes, so you can quote me on it if I verify it, and don't quote me on it if I don't. But in every game where Greenway has played more snaps than Captain Munnerlin, the Vikings have lost, and not only that... Uh, they've given up worse defensive performances in those games than they have in other games, which is a more significant uh, point because the Vikings have lost a lot of games recently, so it's not unique to say that they lose those games. Um, but yeah, I think that this is something that obviously needs to be addressed in the offseason. Emmanuel Lemur is not good enough to cover for it, uh, so they need to... Um, they, they, like, they really need to address linebacker uh, somehow, either in free agency or the draft. But I know a lot of people are like, hey, you should draft all offensive linemen. I know most of those people who say that don't actually believe literally only draft offensive linemen. But I think not enough people are evaluating uh, you know, your third linebacker, basically your, your quote-unquote base linebacker, as a draft need, and they should, because I don't think, unless Edmund Robinson's actually good, which I mean, the Vikings don't seem that intent on believing, um, they, they should really address the base linebacker position. Uh, Anthony Barr uh, is, has, is did what he did all year, which is not much. Speaking of not much, can we talk about the backfield? Oh, man. Well, so this is interesting. If you take away the penalties... Let's, but, but you can't. But let's, you I mean, let's, let's can't. Imagine. And, well, and we, can, we can maybe, like, cap... The recap with uh, with the discussion of the uh, garbage state of penalty calling in the NFL. But until then, if you take away the penalties, pretty good for the cornerbacks. <laughs> well, that wow you you went for li- like literally every hedge. 
Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> when you take away plays with penalties, the cornerbacks and only the cornerbacks played well in coverage. If wishes were horses, we'd all 1, be in wish meat. <laughs> I don't get that phrase. Um, <laughs> well, how about this? Uh, if my aunt had balls, she'd be my uncle. I've heard that one many times, and that makes sense, kind of. It's a little transphobic. Anyway, um, the quarterbacks, Matthew Carl pointed out that, the, that uh, Xavier Rhodes and Terrence Newman only gave up 10 yards in coverage. As they would, because they are not uh, two backups playing at a critical position. Well, okay, yes, so Sandejo so, so is not a backup. So like, hot. He he was he was like Joe Berger moved into a position, and uh, then a worse backup took his position, and then all hell broke loose. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Uh, so Anthony Harris gave up. So this is oh my god. Uh, this is another up and down thing. Like why are all the replacement players playing terrible? Anthony Harris had some really good plays, man. I just want to—I just want to say that before I like eviscerate him. He had some really good plays. A lot of like force plays where he didn't touch the ball, but you know redirected the running back. A lot of plays where he got into the backfield uh, and and had a great tackle. Um, just he had some really good plays that are really worth identifying. He was a quick reactor to a lot of what was happening in the run game and identified where he needed to be really quickly. Some really nice stuff. Well, okay, but on the flip side, like a lot of people who were really like on the outs in their fantasy football playoffs with Andrew Luck as their quarterback were like, ah, this is going to be terrible. And then they woke up to about a million points. And I think a lot of that is on Harris. It is. No, uh, so, so I just wanted to say that because his bad plays are significantly more important than his good plays. I mean, obviously. As per uh, the, uh, the, the postmortem game script. Right. So uh, he gave up, um, I, w- I want to make sure I get the yardage numbers correct because it's freaking sad. I think, he, I think he's responsible for the 50-yard reception of Philip Dorsett. Yep. Who, I want to clarify, is bad. No, Philip did, Dorsett did, is bad. Didn't he get burned on like one like weak juke or something and then caught it running? Or Sandejo got burned on one weak juke and then uh, the receiver caught the ball running. And then just never stopped. Yeah, that happened. <laughs> like, yep. And I don't know what else to tell you. Uh, Whoops. T. Y. Hilton also got one on uh, on Anthony Harris specifically for thirty one yards. Uh, that was bad. I don't know how else to put it. Bad things are bad. Oops. Uh, and then Andrew Sandejo, of course, like you said, um, had his own problems. He, his, his problems were... So, okay, so Andrew Sandejo didn't have nearly the positive impact on positive plays that Anthony Harris did. He also didn't have nearly the negative impact on negative plays as Anthony Harris did. I would argue that he played better than Anthony Harris, but not by a ton. Not all of his tackles were good, but some of them were. Okay, but, so but would that. you make that argument just like in general about uh, safeties? Like if you if you don't do as much positive stuff, but you give up fewer mistakes, does that constitute better? Yeah, I think given the nature of the safety position, like yeah, because positive plays from safeties are really good and nice. They usually lead to turnovers or sacks or something. Uh, negative plays from safeties like lose games. Like, safety is kind of like offensive tackle, where you're probably going to be defined by your mistakes more than you are sort of, like, the stuff that you're really good at. Like, we've seen, like, those highlights where, like, Teron Armstead or Tyron Smith or, like, Orlando Pace or whatever, like, lay down a block. They're stride for stride with the running back that they're blocking for, and they lay down a block, like, 40 yards downfield. They blow up this poor linebacker or defensive back that had no chance. Uh, and it's the key block that you know creates the touchdown or whatever, right? We've seen, and those are positive plays, right? Matt Khalil, for example, was actually a really good screen blocker in every year that he's played in the NFL. He's a really talented screen blocker. He, like all offensive tackles, were judged by his mistakes. 
uh, because that's appropriate for the nature of the position. Your mistakes have a much bigger impact in the game, and that's what people scout for, and that's what people pay for uh, when they get offensive tackles. Your mistakes have a much larger impact in the game, so that's kind of true for safeties as well. Uh, a box safety is it's less true for, so for Cam Chancellor, it's less true for than it is for Earl Thomas. Um, but, yeah. I, yeah. Sadeo still had, like, a below-average game. I don't think anyone would, like, disagree with that. Well, no, but, I mean, he was, he was surrounded by a, uh, a crew on a ship of fools. Yeah. So you can't, like, you can't blame him for, for everything. And, again... He, like Joe Berger, was moved into a different position because the person who was supposed to be playing that position was out. Although, uh, Sandeha had the benefit of only one person being missing in that position and not three. It's true. I mean, it's, it's weird. So he, like, he rotates up to, to Smith and then Harris rotates to place him. I don't know, it's just a mess. Um, yeah, it's, <laughs> it's, it's brutal. Uh, so I was checking out Pro Football Focus's uh, post-game recap. So they both actually have Harrison Sandeo as one of the top five defensive players of the Vikings. Mind you, none of the top five players posted a score above 80. 70 is about an average score. So uh, top five doesn't mean a lot in this context, but both of Sandeo and Harris scored above a 70. And I think this is a good example of how uh, individual play-by-play grading would say that on most plays, these guys played mostly well but the worst players are the ones that were, like, pretty big. Um, they have, you know, a relatively positive grade for Linval Joseph. They had a pretty positive grade for Chad Greenway. They had a great grade for Terrence Newman. Um, but, you know, they, they, make the same, they make the same point that we've been making, basically pounding on, on the nature of the Colts defense, or the Vikings defense, is that even though they've had a couple of play-by-play successes and, you know, forced the Colts to go to big plays in order to make up for stuff, uh, big plays were definitely, like, the story of the game. And, you know, the safeties made uh, mistakes in those big plays. Linval Joseph made, you know, a huge mistake on a big play. Chad Greenway made mistakes in big plays. Uh, Just, like, mostly mostly explosive plays, you know, did did the Vikings in more than, like, any, like, consistent, efficient effort. Uh, And you can... You can kind of see that in uh, in the way that like these players are distributed. Like Frank Gore, for example, a lot of people remember him having a good game. He averaged three point nine yards a carry, um, but it was mostly like big plays from uh, you know players like Turbin and Gore and stuff like that that uh, that did the Vikings in more than like efficiently good effort. Do you think he's pissed that uh, Turbin got the one yard run for the touchdown or not him? I'm sure he's fine. I don't think he's got Probably like. Not. I don't think he cares. It's not like a Mark. It's not like a Mark Ingram thing where he's like one touchdown away from a hundred thousand dollar bonus. Did you hear about that? What really? No. He's one touchdown away from a one hundred thousand dollar bonus, and he got pulled off the goal line uh, on Sunday, and he like blew up on the sideline. Wow. Wow. Oh. I can understand it. I know how. How fr- well, and and who do you like? Like, what's the chain of command in that situation? Like, do you does does Frank Gore like immediately like go to his coordinator and be like, "Hey, man, what about my bonus?" And he's like, "No, you got to call payroll about that." Like, does he have a cell phone on the sideline? Like, can can he call up to the booth? Can he be like, "Hey, guys, like, what about my what about my bonus?" And they're like, "No, nah, man, we don't know about that." <laughs> and Frank and Frank Gore is like, "Merry Christmas, motherfucker!" And then throws his headset down. I'm sure that last part happens. I'm not sure. Well, he doesn't have a headset, but I'm sure that last part happens. I don't. I don't but, know. But, but how can you talk to the guys to upstairs without a headset? Like he borrows somebody's headset and he like puts it on for a second. He's like, "Hey, man." That would be that would be incredibly boss. What, what players in the NFL would do that? Odell would do it. Adrian Peterson Who else would do it. Adrian. <laughs> yeah. I think that Adrian would do it if he had thought about it. Odell, uh, Cam Newton is on that list. Colin Kaepernick is on that list. Um, uh-huh, uh-huh. And Kung Su. Easily on that list. Oh, Richard Sherman. Brock Ostweiler. Really? Well, okay, so everyone on the Seattle defense. Yeah, but Richard Sherman the most. Richard Sherman is the most take-the-headset-out-of-the-coordinator's-head 
and speak into it player. That, that's in the true. NFL. He, he wouldn't, uh, he wouldn't wait for his turn to wear the headset. He would, he would right. take it and like, he wouldn't even put the earpiece on. He would just yell into the mic. Right. Cause he doesn't need the, he just needs to say what he needs to say. He doesn't, he doesn't want to hear anything response. about it. He doesn't want to hear. He just wants to tell you. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's, that's a, that's a pretty good list. I'm trying to think. Are there any, uh, JJ Watt, maybe? No, J. no actually, he's no, way I too. Because JJ Watt like respects he's, like authority. He respects the chain of command. Yeah, he's he is functionally like. Actually, I'm going to leave that one alone. But he is functionally a military person in a football uniform. Yeah, no, he is. Uh, let's see. I think I think young Greg Olson would have done it, just like Jeremy Shockey would have done it. But I don't think old Greg Olson does it. Steve Smith oh, uh, does it. Richie Incognito. Oh, yeah, easily. Richie Incognito definitely does it. Uh, Lamar Miller, maybe. Mike Evans, maybe. Lamar Miller should. I don't know that he would. <laughs> <laughs> I like that take. <laughs> That's a good take. All right. Lamar Miller needs to defend his own interest. <laughs> needs to. That's a um, that's a pretty good list. Is there anyone in the Seattle Seahawks defense that wouldn't? I'm not convinced Earl Thomas would, but he's no longer he's on the defense. Not on the defense. And I, I imagine that that like reality influences his belief. <laughs> like if he was still playing, he would be the last. But uh, Sherman and Chancellor would get to him, and he'd be like, "All right, man, uh, yeah, all or nothing." True. But now that he's injured, he's like, I don't know about Deshaun Shedd, so he might not. But Michael Bennett absolutely would. Tony McDaniel would. Cliff Averill would. Uh, Jerron Reed? He's a rookie. He might not. No, he definitely would. Dude, if Richard Sherman Sherman tells you to do something and you're a rookie, you do it. Okay, but he wouldn't do it of his own accord, right? Does that matter? I I, I don't know anything about him. Uh, So Bobby Wagner would. um, He'd be really nice about it. <laughs> KJ Wrightwood, Richard Truman would, Cam Chancellor would. I don't know if Stephen Terrell is, and I don't know if Deshaun Shedd would. But like the, that's the so the players that I don't know about are Jerron Reed, uh, Terrell Stephen, and Deshaun Shedd. Stephen Terrell. Man, I gotta, I gotta feel like it's a top-down organization. And if Richard and Cam come to you. And it's top like, down among the players. It's definitely not top down when you go from like coaching two players. No, that's that, that's what I'm saying. Is that if uh, Richard Sherman and Cam Chancellor are committed to it, then you're either coming along or you're going to have a hard life. <laughs> so okay, here's a good question: Would Marshawn Lynch? Yes. You think like because because he's like he's like s- extremely team oriented, like. He loves his offensive line. And he like talks about them all the time. He doesn't. He doesn't like stick up for himself that often. He just chooses not to talk to people and is like he pisses off a lot of people because like I'm just here not to get fined. But like he like loves the team and stuff. Nah, he would uh, he would sign up for what the team what the team believed was best and then not talk about it. But like media. Russ wouldn't. Because like that's the thing. Like Russell Wilson wouldn't. Unless, uh, I don't know, God told him to. Um, or Ciara did. Right. Well, I mean, that's obviously. But if neither of those two entities tell him to, I think Russ would counsel against it. I think Marshawn doesn't want to upset the offense of Applecart. So I don't think he does it. But I think, I think it's a good debate because he's super weird. Man, see, I don't... I don't think that fits in with the way that Pete Carroll coaches. Like... Like Russell Wilson is kind of like the weird cult leader or cult person. He's like the like the Will Smith of yeah. of the Seattle Seahawks. And that's that's fine for him. But you know, the rest of these guys are our team. And Marshawn Lynch has, like you said, defined himself by being a member of that team. Right. And uh I know it's just like Marshawn Lynch's defiance is is literally silence, whereas Richard Sherman's defiance is the opposite. And that's why I'm like, 
because they're both like characterized by this like anti-authoritarian approach to stuff, which Pete Carroll like totally embraces because like he doesn't believe that jet fuel melts steel beams and all that. Mm-hmm. But uh, but the way that they like thumb their nose at authority is is different. Like Pete Carroll chooses to have fun in an anti-fun league. Marshawn Lynch just like doesn't talk to people and Richard Sherman talks to literally everybody he can. He writes articles for Sports Illustrated and the Players Tribune just so he could talk more. He like takes over press conferences and Okay, like, but, but Marshawn Lynch has. goes on like the Jimmy Fallon show and like plays video games on yeah, YouTube. Yeah, plays video like, games. Like, that's, not, that's different, man. That's not that's not defying anything. That's just like, yeah, I want to do fun stuff. Well, but that's what uh I mean maybe Richard Sherman just has a different definition of fun stuff. I'm just, I'm, but that's my point. Like at the end of the day, I don't think Russell Wilson is L. Ron Hubbard. I don't think he has any particular control over any players on the team. And I think well, that okay, that's that's fair. But I still think that Marshawn that Lynch, the, as a defiant personality, is not the kind of defiance that would like rip a rip a headset off a coordinator's head and like speak into it. He he would do it before the game because it's funny. Have you but seen he Rogue One during a game because he was mad? Have you seen Rogue One? I haven't yet. Ah, then the annoying analogy I was about to make will be lost on you and all Great. the listeners who have not seen it, because I will not spoil a terrible film for you in that way. Wow, people are so torn on this. Like a lot of people love it, mostly because it's fun, not because of like any inherent like filmmaking quality, but they love it. And a lot of Whatever, man. Really it was a better and more relevant movie when it was called The Hurt Locker. Wow. That's a take. Damn. I'm now super excited to see this because it's like very polarizing. A bunch of critics hate it. I haven't seen many critics that like it. Uh, NPR like eviscerated it. Um, and I'm only saying that because I was like driving uh, on the way to the station and NPR was eviscerating it at the same time I was receiving like DM notifications from people who loved it. And I was like, this is weird. Do you love war? Does does war make you hot? Then you will love Rogue One. And I was told like the actors didn't have any chemistry with each other. What? The, the it is Star Wars, Wars after all. Well, oh, like, you trust can't me, the, tell the me dialogue that, is that still terrible. Han and, and Leia didn't have chemistry. Oh my god. All the dialogue is still garbage. All the actors are directed into nonsense. Like it's well, yeah, that's that's true for all of the the prequel and post prequel stuff. Yeah, that's true for that's, all of it. Yeah, that's 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 one of the and what's most annoying about the franchise is that Disney appears to like embrace that. Like, okay, well, this is this is a franchise that you know attempts to tell a very simple story with a lot of really like fancy stuff and terrible dialogue. And I was like, oh wow, I saw a movie like this once. It was The Hurt Locker. Everybody in that movie had dirt on their faces. <laughs> But this is not that discussion. We should probably do a mailbag before we completely descend into nonsense. We're doing pretty Isn't well. That so what the far. mailbag is? No, the mailbag has some football questions, doesn't it? Uh, well, uh, Mr. T. Marco at AJ Marco sixty five writes in: Who said screw this game first? I assume between you and me. Oh, I th- I thought you meant like among the players. No, oh, because right, like one well, of the memes that the players gave up on the game. That's a uh, an interesting and different question. Um, well, Adrian Peterson, obviously. But between the two of us, probably you, because I was at the game and I was more invested in it not being meaningless. Uh, I think uh, I gave up when the Colts scored their third touchdown. What? This is sad. When was that? <laughs> Before halftime. Okay, I was, yeah, I gave up. Uh, I was done at halftime. Uh, I gave up after halftime. Okay, so it was me. So uh, as far as players, though, um, I... You don't think it's Adrian? Yeah, I got to agree with you there. Well, okay, I mean, so... Like, it can't be... It, but it can't but be to be fair, we've, we've, been, we've been talking on the podcast about how Adrian Peterson has basically been quietly saying, screw this game, like, the whole time. <laughs> right. It like can't he, be anyone but the guy that was like, I'm only going to play if they're in the playoffs. He, he beat everyone to that when he went on some internet radio station and said he was going to play. 
That was that was who said screw this game first. Josh Bjork has a uh, one piece left. That was not a question or half a seat's question that we answered. Uh, sorry, every fan is pissed this week. And uh, by way of follow up, Zen Cupid as NDBP. Did we somehow deserve this? What did we do wrong? Why? You assholes cheered for these assholes. Now you're the asshole. I know. Who's the asshole now? I mean, not every fan is pissed. I'm not. I'm not mad. I'm just disappointed. <laughs> and not for any like like I knew the Vikings weren't gonna like win anything for as much as we talked about how this is gonna be our year like back when we thought we might have Teddy Bridgewater and Adrian Peterson for an entire season although one suddenly seems like a much better deal than the other <laughs> isn't it crazy though like if you could ask fans at the beginning of the year alright someone's gonna get injured you can only choose one, Adrian Peterson to Teddy Bridgewater. A lot of fans would have trouble choosing. Like, we wouldn't have. And a lot of the people that listen to our show wouldn't have because they put up with our anti-Adrian nonsense. Oh, but, it's not nonsense. And the reason it's not nonsense is the same reason that a lot of people who don't listen to the show would immediately be like, we don't need Teddy. We're going to go back to a classic run offense with a 32-year-old running back coming off at two career-ending surgeries with a giant attitude who has ridden a camel. Well, I don't know how important that camel is to like projecting future game outcomes, but I get your point. I, I, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, but like a lot of people would have trouble choosing. And I would say those people don't... Under, no, I'm just going to say they were clinging to the past. How about that? I'll just say that. Um, they're, they're focusing their lens on the wrong ant. There you go. Th that is a super curious analogy, but it works here. Uh, <laughs> I should have said magnifying glass, but whatever. I'm magnifying so, okay, glass actually, I like I like this. Like so, you like before the season, you walk up to a Vikings fan. It's like, okay, you could only have Teddy Bridgewater or Adrian Peterson. One of them's going to get injured. It's going to be the one that you don't choose. And they take like. 10 minutes to decide. It takes a long time to decide because Teddy Bridgewater is really mostly showing potential. He looks really good, but you know, he doesn't score a lot of touchdowns or whatever. Yeah, whatever. They're, they're taking time, right? It takes them 10 agonizing minutes they choose. Then you go, surprise, motherfucker, they're both injured. <laughs> what quarterback do you pick? <laughs> and so then Sam any, anyone who's like, oh, uh, what's Sam Bradford doing? Then you give him a cookie. <laughs> Sam Bradford, he cost first-round pick. Mark Sanchez, he's free. Oh, are you kidding me? Wow, we <laughs> definitely chose correctly. He's free. Look, man, we're not making the playoffs either way, evidently. <laughs> but that has... But okay, we but look, 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 are, are, are we going to relitigate this a fourth time? Like, we litigated it twice on the show, and now the articles are, like, hitting the Vikings blogosphere and Vikings Twitter that are basically saying the same things that we did. Like when we went uh, anti Bill Barnwell, when he was like, well, obviously the Sam Bradford trade was a dumb idea because they're not going to make the playoffs. And I mean, we, we described at length why that's not his fault and why he's playing the best football of his, like going to the Vikings was the best thing that Sam Bradford could have ever done for Sam okay. Bradford. So from like a truth and like, commitment to intelligent argument perspective, you're right. Like, from the perspective of, like, being intellectually honest, that's true. But, could add a first-round pick. But from Donald Trump's perspective... <laughs> okay, no, 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 we're not doing that. We're not doing that. All right. Um, CT, at the 16643, writes in, what's the best way to ease the pain besides alcohol? Uh, is this a... A question that requires legality? I do not understand the question, and I will not respond to it. <laughs> Depending on the state, marijuana is, is, is known as like a pain reducer. It's like a conversation that they're having in the NFL about you know, pain relievers and stuff. Right? That's, that's what we're talking about. Uh, I am cannabis friendly. Are as you? is the state of Colorado. No way, Which is it. why Shane Ray is playing football in Denver right now. <laughs> <laughs> Do 
John Judich right, uh, at Gazankt writes, so the idea of using bacon fat to confit chicken legs just popped into my head. Does that sound mostly terrible or a little? It sounds a little terrible. Just like maybe a bit much for me. Well, okay, so the idea is actually a French classic. And really? uh, I would, I, oh yeah. I would go so far as to suggest uh, confiting chicken wings. And actually, I'm going I'm to dial back just a second and say that we probably shouldn't call... Actually, actually no, yeah, we can. Because uh, confiting something, which is a, a, a Westernism, they don't, they don't call it that in France where the technique originated. Um, a, a duck confit or like a chicken confit, anything, anything confit... Is basically it's in its like, own fat, right? Well, no, no, uh, not necessarily. Uh, oh, okay. Things like chicken have historically been uh, made a confit with uh, duck fat or pig fat or whatever fat was lying around. Uh, oils. If you have duck fat, why not just confit the duck? Jeez, basic stuff, French people. Okay, but what if you have more duck just fat kidding. than you have it's duck? It's fine. It's fine. Then you can just start kidding. using it on chickens. What if you have sure, more pig fat the chicken. than you have pigs and you can start using it on chickens but see the the whole thing about uh confit as a preparation is it's basically like pickling in fat as opposed right. to like pickling in sugar or pickling in acid and generally the way that like like restaurants that offer like like a duck leg confit on top of like some wild rice for like 27 dollars is uh they'll they, they they might do like a proper like confit pickling where they cook the you know duck leg in its own fat at like 200 degrees for multiple hours and then finish it in a pan but more often uh the the process involves shorter time and higher heat so it's not really like a like a true confit preparation are you going somewhere with this if you have way too many chicken legs and you want to keep them in the fridge for a way longer time than you ever could were they just regular old chicken then yeah Pack those fools in fat and heat them at 200 degrees for a few hours. And uh, yeah, you'll have But there's a, a difference between like the strength of flavor between like some kind of pig fats and bacon fat. Oh, well, uh, there is a traceable like Western uh, culinary history. And I, that's like maybe five years old <laughs> where chefs are doing that. Yeah, you can totally confit chicken legs with bacon fat. And it tastes great. In fact... It's not too much. I'm just saying, like, I'm worried that it might be too much. Well, no, okay, so... Uh, confit, low temperature, right? The moisture in the meat stays inside. So you don't really get any crispy skin, but you get, like, a, like a cooked interior where the moisture stays inside, but you get, like a, like, a thin layer of, like, delicious bacon fat on the outside. And then you can finish it however you want. You can finish it in a pan with more bacon fat, whatever. It doesn't matter. Uh, Nathan Mirvold, the guy that wrote the Modernist Cuisine cookbook with all the money he got from being a patent troll and a guy at Microsoft for a long time, um, claims that you can do the, you can get the same effect that you would get making confit chicken legs by just making sous vide chicken legs. I knew you were going to bring up sous vide at this point. And basting them with bacon fat. I'd rather just do that instead. Uh, do you have an emergency circulator and a yes. vacuum sealer? Oh, oh, yeah. All right. I've been talking about sous vide on this show forever now. Why wouldn't I have it? I just, I just wanted to make clear for the audience the tools you would need. Yeah, it's, it's specialized. To, um, to, you don't need a vacuum sealer. It's just like, if you don't, you need to be really confident in like whatever bags you're using. And if you're, like, concerned about, like, plastic leaching and stuff, like, maybe sous vide isn't for you, well, unless you've got a vacuum sealer with, like, the appropriate, like, because, like, the vinyl polyurethane bags and food saver bags do not leach. But, yeah. Nowadays, a food saver plus one of those uh, Anova emergency circulators, you're out the door for, like, 200 bucks, which yeah, is... Yeah, it's not as bad as it used to be. Yeah, it's, it's probably fine. Um, I'm here to tell you, though, comfy chicken wings are where it's at. Especially if you reserve the uh, the bacon fat to um, finish, like at high temperature, like to put a crispy skin on the uh, bacon fat confit chicken wings. That is something that is like 
some mad scientist shit. So, so Jonathan, you are not too far off, and you are not crazy. I don't think it sounds terrible at all. I didn't say terrible. I never said terrible. I, th- I think Let's you said a little. Up. I think you went with a little. I realized it was a binary choice, but I think you went with a little. No, I was just like it might it might be too strong a flavor. That's all. If it was. Like uh, it would only be too know, strong a flavor if or... you finished the uh, the cooking process. If you gave it that crispy skin, because the uh, like I said, the uh, the fat flavor doesn't really penetrate the meat that much because confit is mostly a means of preservation, so that you could have something in your fridge or in your cellar for months that would still be safe to eat later. Because you know, pure fat is a bacterial wasteland. Like pure sugar. Which is like so interesting. Anyway, next question. No, that was it. Oh, wait, no. Is it? Sorry. Uh, that, that is not correct. There is one email question. Stop lying to us, man. Stop lying to us, the Norse Code listeners. Also, Look, you, me. you are, by saying that, implying that the last thing I said was a lie, which is the worst kind of hashtag fake news. <laughs> Oh, we got to talk about the fake news that happened. Hold on. We have, we have one more email question. Fine. Brian James writes in, I don't blame Zimmer for the season's collapse, but it's got me pondering his coaching mortality. It seems like when once successful coaches get fired, the stated reason is something that was there all along, but overlooked in the good times. <laughs> Look, the Vikings have good times. <laughs> Chip Kelly was a hottie control freak. Jim Harbaugh was 10 pounds of psychopathy in a five pound pleated khaki bag. <laughs> okay, that's pretty good. Yeah, that's uh, good. What's Zimmer? I don't actually. So the nice thing about Chip and Harbaugh, former Forty f- ers coaches, Chip and Harbaugh, <laughs> like, good job, guys. Um, is that there's like one dominant character trait that is both a uh, a positive and a negative that you could point to as like the overriding flaw that they got rid of somebody. Um, which, incidentally, like, obviously, firing Harbaugh was an awful decision, and people thought it at the time. So it's not as if, like, people were like, oh, what's happening with Harbaugh? Why is he a bad coach now? And, like, no one was like, no one was like that except for, like, Jed York. Um, so that is a little bit different. But I don't think there's, like, an overriding single personality flaw that, you know, sticks out with Zimmer. Because it's not like he's too tough, right? Like, that's, like, the thing with Zimmer is that he's, like, this tough old school guy, you know, really doesn't seem like he's too tough or even too old school because like he's willing to embrace, uh, you know, a front office that is, that has become increasingly engaged in analytics. He's willing to embrace updates, to the offensive strategy. I mean, it's the reason they got rid of North Turner. So I don't know if there's like an overriding personality feature that you could say is both the flaw and the, and the feature of coaches. Like it was for, you know, uh, Chip Kelly and sort of mistakenly for Jim Harbaugh. Although like Jim Harbaugh is still like nuts. Like that that's been true. So he's a good coach. I mean, yeah, he's a good coach, but I, I feel like the the thrust of the question was that, you know, we all like to let history be written by the winners and uh, I guess shoot the losers. I'm just saying that, like, with Harbaugh, I don't know that it was. I think that the only people that peddled the Jim Harbaugh as a psychopath and therefore he's an unfit coach for the 49ers were the people who fired him. Like, I think everybody thought that that was a bad idea to fire him. So I don't know if that's as fair. Like, it's not as fair to say that as it was for Chip, because for Chip it was just like he was always a control freak, but we glossed over it. And then he got too much control, and he exerted it, and like he got rid of Sean Jackson and Sean McCoy, uh, who were having like freaking career years, right? Wow. Um, that's that's what I'm saying. Mike Zimmer has myopia. Mike Zimmer had 20-0 vision when the team needed him to lead. Is what the people who will fire him would say. So you think that that's a thing that could have been identified early but was glossed over? No, I'm just saying that it's easy to find reasons to fire someone in retrospect, and uh, the eye patch makes for a... Oh, with the literal myopia. Yeah. Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God, you missed... Oh, yeah, no, that's... Yeah. Jesus. <laughs> Is it myopia when you don't have depth perception? Is that, like, the same thing? Um, 
Well, now I have to look up the official definition, but I believe myopia it's just nearsightedness, right? Is um, <laughs> yeah, nearsightedness. Yeah, it's, it just he doesn't have depth. Or that's different. Okay, but your vision suffers at greater distances when you lack depth perception. Does it, or can you just not tell the difference? This is a very important discussion. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like you are belaboring it. <laughs> Tell you what, you find something at your desk that is about arm's reach away and close one eye and reach for it, and you tell me. This won't prove anything, but, uh, okay. Oh, I did a great job reaching it. Yay! Now, uh, close one eye and reach for something that is outside your window. What? I, uh, there's nothing else. I can't see it. I've got a curtain closed. Look, it's been a real pleasure working with you. I'm afraid <laughs> you're going to have to come back to Denver on the plane with us. I hope that's not awkward. <laughs> anyway. So what about this, uh, this Vikings fake news? We were like... I, I, I watched the whole thing happen on Twitter and, and like both of us were like like tangentially like choosing carefully what to subtweet and like retweet because it didn't seem like a like a real thing and I mean I, I think you uh hit the finest point more quickly than anyone else is that it, it, it seems like a like a massive waste of resources to keep a stadium closed and heated and secured for people to sleep in. Yeah, that's what's nuts to me. It's like, so okay, so if the Vikings do it at cost and like pay for it, like if they tell the you know Metropolitan State Facility Authority, whatever it's called, Stadium Facility Authority, I don't know, um, they tell the MSFA that they want to do it and that they'll pay for it and that they'll pay for the heating and the security and all that. That's like fine. That's a really nice gesture. It's super inefficient, but it's like their money, I guess. So the, okay, cool. But like. The fact that this fake news that the Vikings would, uh, to clarify for anyone who didn't know about this, uh, two people, I ended up retweeting one of them because I'm a moron. Uh, but I know, I did it too accounts. after Arif did it because I'm yeah. also a moron. Right. They're both verified accounts, incidentally. So it's like, so I checked to see if it was right. Anyway, uh, Jake Nyberg and some guy named David at DDN, some of them, um, tweeted out that the Vikings would open up the stadium to shelter uh, the homeless because, you know, it was a record-breakingly cold like night. a historically cold night, yes. Right. Um, which is, like, it's very feel-goody, which is true. But it was fake. It was a lie designed to pressure the Vikings into doing it um, because they felt that if the taxpayers, and if it's the People's Stadium, right, if they felt that, which I'm actually the only people I've ever heard refer to it as the People Stadium or being sarcastic. So I don't really know why people think, hey, if it's the People Stadium. Um, but anyway, uh, they felt that if a, a partially or mostly publicly funded stadium existed, why shouldn't it be used for you know a purpose like this? And that these like, are people who know, have never been familiar with the history of sports stadiums in America, apparently. Right. These, uh, right. Let, me, let me guess. Jake is like 22 and is just now learning, like. His, his his petals are unfolding now, and he's realizing that it's all like 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 the stadium building thing is a great big hustle that billionaires use to extract money from states. Right. Now he's learned. Also, I don't know. I hope you learned more than that. To do it. Good lord. So like so okay. This is like why wouldn't you just pressure every school to do it? Those are literally owned by the state, and there's more of them, so you can distribute. Like, because there's like 10,000 homeless people in Minnesota. They're not all next to the Metrodome, or not the Metrodome, U.S. Bank Stadium. Trains don't go to schools. Yeah, but there's more people near schools than there are near the stadium. That's, that's true, but uh, I don't know. It just seems but, to okay, be so like... The essential point is that it is a massively inefficient thing. Like, so the Vikings do it at cost, that's fine. But like to pressure the team into it is like totally not even the team the the stadium authority into it is a total misunderstanding of like a way that you should budget and allocate funds for sheltering the homeless. Like it costs a lot of money to heat up a stadium, and it costs even more money to secure it, and it costs even more money 
to uh, properly stack because there's no food in it anymore. They took all the food out. <laughs> like, are they gonna starve in there? Like, like well, yeah, they're not gonna they're not gonna starve in in one night. But who's gonna make I them leave in the morning? You know, who's who's gonna clean up the pee? Who's gonna stop them from smoking cigarettes inside? Like, there are so many ancillary costs that it's just like and. Furthermore, and this is where, like, this is what really made me feel like a rube. If this sort of thing were to happen, you don't think the league would be way out in front of it? That's true, right? You don't think Roger Goodell would personally be opening the big door to U.S. Bank Stadium as a bunch of, like, people in blankets, like, shuffle off the trains into the stadium and there's, like, a like a bright orange light, like, shining on his orange head and a camera, like, close up on him, like, give us your tired, you're poor. <laughs> right, like, it would obviously be, like, a huge thing. Also, so I was trying to look up, like, how much it takes to, like, freaking heat up a stadium, like, how much it costs per hour. It's very difficult to find this out. Um... Turns out stadiums, incidentally, use extremely energy-efficient lights, which still costs a ton of money. Um, But, like, in the summer, I know that the Dallas stadium costs $10,000 an hour to air condition. And I'm going to assume, because the stadium is designed to leach heat so it keeps snow off, like, so the stadium is designed to let some heat through to melt the snow that lands on the stadium, uh, which is pretty smart. Um, so it actually, it costs more to heat it up because it's not as insulated as it could be on purpose. Uh, I'm going to assume that maybe that's a fair cost for the stadium. Um, $10,000 an hour. Okay. But, but let me ask you this. Do you believe that at any point the, uh, the engineers and architects involved had any input onto whether or not the stadium could be used as an airsats homeless shelter? No, of course not. Like Why? <laughs> Well, what are, they gonna, are you going to bring in cots? Who's bringing in the cots? That costs money. Are they going to sleep on the turf? Oh, p- please no. I mean, <laughs> I mean, nothing. I'm not like you know, nothing against the 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 plight of people who have less, but or nothing. Actually, no, it's functionally the plight of people who have nothing, but not our precious turf. <laughs> right. So they're not going to bring in like anyway. So let's say. It costs eighty thousand dollars to like house them for like probably a hundred thousand dollars when you include all the ancillary equipment. Let's, let's push it up. Let's make it eight hundred thousand. Why would eight for the night? Yes, it's not going to cost a million dollars to house them for one night. Ten thousand dollars an hour for eight hours just to keep the place warm, plus security costs, plus entry and exit. Right, so I was, costs, yeah, so I was thinking like, it was a hundred thousand dollars just for the heating, and the equipment. Then, obviously, you have to pay for security. Let's say there's the, so the stadium seats, what, like almost 80,000? I mean, technically, it only seats 60,000, but it has space to seat 80,000. Okay, so if the stadium were filled... I can't believe I'm doing this right now. If the stadium were filled to capacity by homeless people, then <laughs> we'd be looking at, uh, what, one security officer for every 100 homeless people? Yeah, that sounds good. That would be uh, 800 security officers. You know there's like not 80,000 homeless people in the state of Minnesota, right? There's 10,000. Wait, so, okay, so, so let's say we're, we're housing every homeless person in Minnesota, all 10,000 of them. Yeah, all the way from Duluth to Rochester. Yeah, okay, they all, they all get on a bus. And make it in time. And right. they all get in. Let's say there's a, let's, let's dial it down. Let's make it Minnesota nice. Let's say there's one security officer for every 50 people. That's 500 security officers at, you know, let's, let's, let's say we're, we're paying them very little. Let's say $10 an hour to make the math easy, just to make the math easy. That's $5,000 an hour for eight hours is another $40,000. It's actually not that bad. Yeah, it's like, no one's going to pay him $10 an hour. <laughs> Just put that out there. Would it, would it be closer to 15 or would it be closer to 8 Well, I mean, no, no. Let's make it closer to, like, what the new minimum wage is going to be. <laughs> I mean, it is Minnesota. I'm just saying, cost of living are lower. I don't... Look, I, I live in a city where we still pay people like they live in Minnesota, even though they live in a place that costs 
twice as much right, per well, anyway, foot. It's $150,000 for the night, let's say. Okay. That's one night. Like, you could, if you distributed that $150,000 to homeless shelters across Minnesota, uh, you'd get more than one night of really good care for, like, the underprivileged in, in, in the state. Right? That, well, like, and, and we are, like, you could do so much better for the underprivileged people in the city of Minneapolis. Because we are, like, we're assuming that all of the homeless people all over the state will find money to bust themselves to this stadium for one night. When the reality is that, like, the, the uh, you know, we, we saw tweets about, like, oh, my gosh, there were so many people waiting to get off the train to go into U.S. Bank Stadium, and then they found out they couldn't. Oh, that's so sad. But, like, what is that, like, 100 people, 200 people? You know? So $80,000 like could do a lot for... of good for those people without having to, you know, put them on a train and, you know, convince them that they were going to get a thing that they weren't actually going to get. You could actually do some lasting good for those people with that kind of money for one night, which keep in mind, that's, that's not even counting. If this were a real thing, the amount of money that the NFL would have put into the PR machine surrounding it. Right. So I just looked up, uh, the cost of running a homeless shelter and, uh, it costs between 17,500 and 23,600, uh, a person a year. So, uh, it's $20,000 a person a year. So if you just, if you just take the $20,000, right. Uh, for the one person a year, divided by the days in the year, you get fifty-five dollars a day for a person. Like that's incredible, right? Like if you, um, so if you take the hundred fifty thousand dollars for the night, divided I'm by actually, fifty-five. I'm actually queuing up a Sarah McLachlan song right now. <laughs> uh, it's that's uh, that that's two thousand seven hundred. Uh, people the hundred fifty thousand dollars could take care of uh like could shelter for a year like it's just incredible well good job jake although actually i i say that facetiously but you know he he claims now that this was a quote-unquote stupid attempt to draw attention to the plight of the homeless which if there are really only ten thousand homeless people in minnesota Y'all have it pretty good. Relatively speaking, they tend not to try and live in Minnesota because it gets cold. Well, uh, they come to live to the in extent Col- that some of them have the ability to move, but also to the extent that Minnesota has like uh, social safety nets that are designed to prevent it. Well, a lot of people come to Colorado when it's warm, and then are suddenly surprised and have no tools to deal with when it gets like Minnesota or North Dakota cold, like it's been this entire last week. And that uh, is its own set of costs. But, like, I don't know. I, I make fun of Jake for, you know, doing this dumb thing. And, and for all of us for, you know, falling for this dumb fake news. If we had stopped and thought about it rationally, we probably would never have retweeted his tweet. But he claims his end goal was to, I guess raise awareness of the plight of the homeless in Minnesota. And we here just broke down the, you know, the finance of it. So, so actual good job, Jake, not, uh, not sarcastic. Yeah, but also, but also, Hey dude, come on. Phew. All right. I think that's it. I think uh, <laughs> I think two hours on that horrible game and all this other stuff is is plenty. Just you wait until later this week when we ideally get uh, Norse Code's least valuable player, the great Justice Mosqueda, to come and take a victory lap about his team that will probably not make the playoffs. Green Bay. By the way, for those, Bay. for those who are still listening, what are you doing? You're like, you've usually been pretty good about not like letting me hear you typing, but you've just been like, is there, is there a Twitter war happening that I need to know about? I'm not the one typing. 
Uh, Chelsea is uh, one table over playing Overwatch. Oh. Well, that, that makes more sense, but at any rate, you can find Norse Code <laughs> at uh, NorseCodePodcast.com or on iTunes or any of your finest podcast aggregators or on Facebook at Facebook.com slash Daily Norseman or on Twitter at Norse Code DN, you can find Arif at Arif Hassan NFL or me at Dusty O'Connell or our producer James at Big Motto. Um, if you feel like this episode is worth anything to you, which actually I enjoyed making this one a lot. I think there's a lot of good uh, info in here that uh, hopefully other people will appreciate and uh, continue to donate to the show so that we can continue making it. You can do so by going to paypal.me slash Norse code or uh, patreon.com slash Norse code and make a one-time donation in any amount you like or a recurring donation in any amount you like, although we suggest about tree fitty. And um, I don't know. There's probably some other promotional stuff, but it's not that important. This was a forgettable game that is probably the functional end to a forgettable season. However... Tune in later this week for what is sure to be an unforgettable episode of Norse Code. As all you long-suffering Vikings fans continue to do. But until then, spoons out! Norse Code is the official podcast of the Daily Norseman SB Nation blog and is produced with cooperation from Pompous Jerk Productions. Pompous Jerk Productions. Attitude with Attitude. The opinions expressed in this podcast are solely those of their contributors and do not reflect official positions of the Minnesota Vikings, SB Nation, the Daily Norseman staff, or PJP. No information in this podcast should be construed as gambling advice. Please obey all local gaming laws. Our formula is this. We go out, we hit people in the mouth.